Hey Sandberg, welcome to chapter six. Chapter six is all about enzyme activity and energy. And so really when we're talking about energy, we're talking about metabolic reactions. So metabolism is the sum of all of our chemical reactions within a cell. And um, for metabolic reactions to occur, we have to have energy. And in cells, metabolic reactions occur using enzymes. So what is energy? Energy, in a nutshell, is the ability to do work. It occurs in every single cell. And the ultimate source of energy comes from the sun. We can't use the sun. I don't think that you have, well, no, I know for a fact that you cannot take sunlight energy and convert it. You can't do that. Um, only plants and other photosynthetic organisms can convert energy from the sun into chemical energy, and chemical energy is what we use. So this is why we take in organic compounds like plants or um, animal to gain our energy. There are different types of energy. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. And potential energy is energy that is stored. Stored energy can be converted to kinetic energy. And kinetic energy can uh, be converted back to stored energy. So here's an example. Um, if you are moving up the steps to a um, diving board, the kinetic energy of your muscles is going to be converted into potential energy when you get to the top. Then you have all of this potential energy prior to diving. It gets converted back to kinetic energy when you dive off the board and then once you're in the water you have less kinetic energy you have um, potential energy that you're going to have to build back up so when I think of kinetic energy I think of energy um, of movement so uh, think about when you are I don't know, working walking, writing notes, listening to my lecture. Those are all things that you need to have energy for. You get your energy from the foods and the drinks that you eat. And when the foods and drinks that you take in are converted, are broken down, I should say, into the tiny monomers like glucose, then we can convert those molecules into ATP energy or energy that our cells use. So we're not producing energy and we're not destroying energy, but we can change energy from one form to another. And that's that first law of thermodynamics. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be converted from one form to another. The second law of thermodynamics states that we can't convert energy from one form to another without the loss of usable energy. So what is the, what is the loss then? The loss actually is heat. So anytime we convert energy from one form to another, we lose energy as heat. And if you think about it, when you get up in the morning, you've been sleeping all night, your body is cold, you're not producing a lot of energy because you're not using your muscles. But once you get up and you start walking around, you start warming up. The reason you're warming up is because you're converting energy from chemical energy to mechanical energy. And you're, whenever you change energy from one form to another, you're losing energy as heat. And that heat is warming your body up. Let's look at an example of conversion of energy. So sunlight is the ultimate form of energy. And so here's sunlight going down and it's 
being taken in by plants, and plants are using photosynthesis, one of their metabolic activities, to produce carbohydrates. Um, these carbohydrates they then can use to either produce energy or they can use to build up structures in the plants. But as they are converting solar energy to a carbohydrate, they give some energy off as heat. And so that's what you're seeing here. As they're converting energy within the plant, um, they're giving some energy off as heat. And so you can see that here. Um, larger animals, like this moose, take in plants, leafy greens, they eat them to gain their energy. And so when they are doing that, they're taking in this delicious organic molecule and taking the chemical, chemical energy and as they convert it from the organic molecule into chemical energy in their body, they release some as heat. And then they use that energy that they took in for movement and for other metabolic activities within the body and some of the energy is lost as heat. So the amount of energy that we gain from animals or from eating something is only about 10% of the energy that they had. So plants gain the majority of the energy. They gain 10% of the sunlight energy which is the ultimate source of energy. Whereas animals that eat plants are only gaining 10% of the plant's energy. And um, animals that eat animals are gaining only 10% of the energy from the animals. So they're, we're gaining very minimal amounts of energy. Oh, sorry. So let's talk about metabolism. I told you that metabolism was the sum of... Um, all of your chemical reactions that occur in your cells, and they can be broken down into two types. Catabolic reactions, which are reactions that break down large molecules into smaller subunits. Anabolic reactions are building up reactions where you take small subunits and you build up a larger molecule. So when I think about this, I always think about cats, and cats will jump on your counters, and they'll knock off glasses, and they'll break them. So catabolic reaction, cats break things. Anabolism, I, um, what I'll say, many people have heard of anabolic steroids, which help to build up muscle. So anabolism is a building up process. Okay, so let's look at anabolic reactions. So we start with some small subunits. And in this case, we're, I'm just showing you an example. So we, we have as our subunits flour, we have sugar, we have nuts, we have baking powder, butter, eggs, chocolate, all the fixings to make a cake. We mix them all together and put them into the oven and we make this beautiful cell cake. So that's an anabolic reaction. So now a catabolic reaction, we take that cell cake and we give it to, and we cut it up and then we eat it and we get so we're taking it in, breaking it down into smaller subunits, and when we do so, we release energy. So catabolic reactions release energy, whereas anabolic reactions, we're going to take energy in. And in the example here, we took energy in from the oven to help mold everything together. Make sense? And if not, that's something you can ask me about since you can't ask me now. All right, so let's talk about what energy that we use is. ATP is the energy currency for our cells, and ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Triphosphate means that there are three phosphates. 
So in chapter two, you learned about the four organic macromolecules of life. One of them was nucleic acids. ATP is a nucleotide, which is a monomer of nucleic acids. And it uses an adenine base, a ribose sugar, and three phosphates. The phosphates, or I should say the um, bond between the second and third phosphate is a high energy bond. And that bond is, is uh, between the ATP wants to be broken. And if it does get broken, then we release the energy. That potential energy is released to um, form kinetic energy or energy of motion, energy of movement, energy of building up. And when we do break that bond, we produce adenosine diphosphate or ADP. Di means two, so now we have the same exact molecule, an adenine and a ribose, but we only have two phosphates, and then we have this extra inorganic molecule, or inorganic phosphate here. So what do we use ATP for? Pretty much everything. ATP um, works in anabolic reactions to build stuff up. ATP starts the catabolic reactions, which is breaking things down. ATP works um, at for transport um, work. So if we're using like ion pumps, um, ATP will power those pumps to push molecules against their concentration gradient. Mechanical work, work of movement of the cell. So here's mechanical work. Um, in this case, we're looking at um, protein molecules that function in muscle movement. This large molecule here is called myosin. This little molecule here is called actin. And they work together to produce movement of our muscles. So that would be mechanical work. Here's transport, ATP binds, and it allows certain molecules to be transported across the plasma membrane um, against their concentration gradient. So here's a lower concentration, here's higher concentration, it's going to go down against the gradient. And then chemical work, here we have some X molecule with a phosphate, we remove the phosphate and find X and Y producing a larger molecule that's an anabolic reaction. So every reaction in our body is um, linked with an enzyme. Enzymes are molecules, are proteins, that decrease the amount of energy it takes for reactions to occur. And enzymes work in metabolic pathways. So we don't just have individual enzymes that work on one process and A converts to B and then we're done. Um, in general, these are very, very complex reactions where we have multiple enzymes that convert some substrate into a product that becomes the substrate for another enzyme. And typically these metabolic pathways, even though this looks like a very straight pathway, these metabolic pathways are very branched. So instead of A converting to B and B converting to C, B might also use another enzyme up here and convert it to like H or be converted down here to L. And so it's a very branch typically when you're thinking of metabolic pathways. But a metabolic pathway in a nutshell is a series of chemical reactions that are catalyzed or that are um, that work with enzymes. An enzyme is a protein 
that speeds up chemical reactions, and it does this by lowering the amount of energy needed for a reaction to occur. So enzymes are catalysts. A catalyst increases the rate of a reaction. Enzymes are proteins, which means, um, well, no, I won't say that yet. Enzymes are proteins, and they bind to some substrate. Typically, the substrate that they're going to bind to is named for, or the enzyme is named for. So an example would be sucrase is an enzyme, and it works on sucrose. And then the function of the enzyme is to lower the amount of energy it takes. So what is the energy that it takes for a reaction to occur? That energy is known as energy of activation. Um, it's the amount of energy that needs to be added for a reaction to occur. And so all reactions typically will go from more stable, or I won't say more stable, I'll say more... Um, organized to less organization. Everything is kind of moving towards entropy or chaos. But the amount of time it would take without an enzyme um, in a living cell, the reactions would not occur fast enough for us to actually see the reactions or for us to actually survive. That's what I'll say. And so the amount of energy that it takes is reduced by enzymes. So here's an example. Um, some process starts here and to produce these products down here, it would take this much energy without an enzyme. But if we have an enzyme, then we reduce the amount of energy here and that would allow us to produce the product much faster. So enzymes are specific to their substrate and they have a region called the active site that binds to the substrate. The enzyme is usable multiple times. It does not get used up in a reaction. And like I said before, it's typically named for whatever substrate it binds with. Here's an example. Here we have an enzyme. Um, this enzyme is called sucrase. And here is the active site. And here's our sucrose molecule. So the enzyme will bind with sucrose and will add water. So this would be a hydrolysis reaction. Once we add water, bonds are broken. The enzyme causes bonds to break, and we produce the monomers, fructose and glucose. Enzymes are proteins that make up Enzymes are proteins that speed up chemical reactions in the cell. A special region on the enzyme called the active site has a shape that fits with specific And so in the reaction that we saw on the last slide, hold on. Specific molecules called reactants or substrates. 
Here, you see that um, formation of two molecules from a single substrate. Form an enzyme substrate complex. The interaction. A lot of people have learned or have heard that enzymes and substrates fit like a lock and a key. Um, the better we, uh, the better model for enzyme and substrate bonding is induced fit, where the enzyme changes in shape slightly so that the substrate and the enzyme can kind of meld together. So I always think of it as the substrate binds and then the enzyme just kind of squeezes or gives the substrate a little hug and that causes whatever reactions are going to occur, either building up or breaking down depending. So here is an enzyme. This is a more, um, a more realistic example of what an enzyme looks like. Um, here's its active site, and here's a substrate. When the substrate binds to the active site, the enzyme kind of squeezes the substrate, and then either bonds will break or bonds will form depending. There are a lot of factors that affect or influence enzymatic activities. Um, some are going to increase enzymatic activity and some will decrease enzymatic activity. Enzymes work very rapidly. They can catalyze millions of reactions every minute, depending on the enzyme we're talking about. Um, so these factors will increase the effectiveness of enzymes up to their optimal effectiveness, or they will decrease the, the effectiveness, okay? So the first one is substrate concentration. The amount of substrate will influence the enzyme activity. If we have a lot of substrate, the enzyme's going to work really effectively at converting the substrate to the product. If we have very little substrate, the enzyme can only you know, convert what it, can, what it um, can catalyze. So if there's only 10 substrates in the environment, within the minute, you know, in general, all 10 will be converted, but it's not going to work as effectively. Temperature and pH. Temperature in increases enzymatic activity to some extent. If we increase the temperature, the enzymatic activity will also increase. But at some point, we're going to have a decrease in enzyme activity. And eventually, if the temperature keeps increasing, then we can actually break down the protein and that is called denaturation. When the protein becomes unusable, when it loses its structure. So the structure of the protein is, is going to determine how well it functions. If the structure is damaged, then it will no longer function. pH also influences um, enzyme activity. Enzymes work at some specific optimal pH. Depending on the enzyme, it might work at a very um, low pH or neutral or a very high pH. And if we move it to a different pH, it's going to cause the enzyme to not work as effectively and eventually could cause the enzyme to denature. Um, enzyme inhibitors. Enzyme inhibitors are um, molecules that either bind to the active site, so they compete for the active site, um, or they bind to another region on the enzyme called the allosteric region, and they cause the active site to change shape. And so that can um, decrease the amount of response or um, product produced. Enzyme activation, some enzymes are inactive and they're in our blood or they're, they might be in our um, stomach and they only get activated when we need them. And so we might cleave a phosphate off or add something to make the enzyme more active. And then we have cofactors. Cofactors are either minerals or um, coenzymes that are vitamins. And these, so either organic or inorganic um, molecules that help enzymes do their job. 
So I always think of a cofactor as like a tutor for a biology class. The enzyme is the instructor. The substrates are her students. And the tutor is the cofactor or coenzyme that helps the enzyme and the substrate fit together. So let's look at each of these a little more closely. Substrate concentration. Um, if we increase the substrate, then we're going to increase the amount of collisions between the substrate and the enzyme. So enzymes don't have eyes, substrates don't have eyes, they can't just touch each other because um, they know where they are, where each other is. They're going to collide with each other and if they collide, then the enzyme will um, catalyze a reaction. If an enzyme has all of the active sites um, filled continuously, then it's going to be working at its maximum potential. So you'd have to have a lot of substrate there for this to work. Um, enzymes can't work better than they can. So if you increase the amount of substrate even more than, than whatever is their maximum rate, they're not going to be able to produce more product because enzymes are only as fast as they are. Temp temperature. Um, if we increase temperature slightly, then uh, molecules move faster. Just like if you watch water um, and you increase the temperature, water starts to roll a little bit, it starts moving faster. Um, that same thing happens with substrates and enzymes. So if they're in some solution and we increase the temperature, these molecules are going to move a little bit faster and we'll have more effective collisions. That being said, if we increase the temperature too much, then um, we denature the protein, the enzyme, and um, it will no longer function. So here is um, typical if we're looking at um, some enzymes, you know, so this is Celsius, um, body temperature, right about here. Um, a lot of enzymes work very effectively at body temperature. And so here's an endothermic organism that um, can maintain its body temperature via homeostasis. And so the enzymes inside work very effectively. Here's an exothermic or an act exothermic, ectothermic organism. He's a cold-blooded organism, also known as a poikilotherm. Um, and these organisms do not have the ability to maintain body temperature. Their temperature is going to be influenced by the environment around them. And so their enzymatic reactions are going to be influenced by the temperature around them. If they're in a warmer environment, they're going to be able to move much more effectively than if they're in a cold environment. They can't move as fast because their enzymes don't work as effectively. pH is another um, factor that will influence enzymatic activity. And so in our body, we have um, most of our enzymes work at a neutral pH. So an example, trypsin is found in the small intestines. It works very effectively between seven and nine. So eight at its um, optimal, which is slightly alkaline, but not very alkaline. Um, in our mouth, we have a pH of about seven. So enzymes in our mouth work very effectively at a pH of seven. But if we go into our stomach, we have pepsin, which is an enzyme that works effectively in very low pH. So a pH of one or two is going to be super effective for pepsin to work. And once pepsin moves into the small intestines um, and the pH increases back to a neutral or even slightly alkaline, then they, the pepsin will no longer function. But um, enzymes that are in our mouth, like the salivary amylase, that works very well at a pH of 7, 
when it moves into the stomach, it will no longer function. It will denature and no longer work. Enzyme activation. So a lot of enzymes are inactive. They um, move through our system. Examples of inactive enzymes. Pepsin is typically found in our stomach as an inactive enzyme known as pepsinogen. We have um, proteins in our blood called um, complement proteins that are inactive naturally. C3, C4, they, they just, um, they're produced by our liver and they're released into our blood. And these just wait for some type of pathogen to come along and activate them. Once we activate them by um, cleaving off a portion or by adding a phosphate, then the enzyme becomes activated and starts working. And we have inhibitors. Inhibitors are molecules that either um, bind to the active site, and so they act as um, com com competitors for the substrate, or they bind to a region um, alternate the active site, known as the allosteric region, and then the, the allosteric region binding causes the, the active site to change in shape and the substrate can't bind. So here is active substrate, or I should say active enzyme, um, active site inhibition. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. Um, so here is some inhibitor molecule binding to the active site. When the substrate comes along, it can't bind, so it's not going to be able to be um, changed, converted from whatever it is to whatever product is supposed to be there. A lot of times, um, the inhibitors are just controlling metabolic pathways, but sometimes these inhibitors are actually um, poisons that can cause problems to the cell. Allosteric inhibition then occurs when an inhibitor molecule binds to the allosteric region and that changes the shape of the, the um, active site. The substrate can no longer bind to the active site. And so again, it's, it's inhibiting binding, so whatever product is supposed to be produced won't be produced. Oftentimes this is how we control, in fact in many cases this is how we control metabolic pathways. Many of the enzyme-catalyzed reactions that occur in a cell, such as those involved in the biosynthesis of an amino acid... So when we need that product again, if we use all of these, this molecule will unbind, be used, and this pathway will start back up. If the end product of a pathway... So poisons are often inhibitors, I told you that. An example is cyanide is an inhibitor. Um, of certain enzymes within the electron transport chain. Um, penicillin is an inhibitor of um, an enzyme used to make peptidoglycan, which is what is found in the cell wall of bacteria. And 
Mal malathion, malathion is a pesticide that um, is used to break down acetylcholine and or inhibits the enzyme used to break down acetylcholine in insects. Um, this is actually the same molecule that we use to break down acetylcholine, so it's called acetylcholine esterase. So if we um, get this broad spectrum pesticide in our system, it will actually cause our uh, um, ability to break down acetylcholine to decrease. And acetylcholine is what helps muscles to contract. So acetylcholine causes muscles to be able to fire. And so our muscles would continuously fire and we wouldn't be able to stop the firing and that could put us into um, a what is it called um, tetanus type of reaction where our muscles are all contracted and we can't relax them and that can cause death because our our respiratory system our diaphragm is muscle and if our diaphragm um, is contracted then we can't breathe anymore okay Enzyme cofactors are molecules that help enzymes. Um, cofactors are the inorganic things like copper, zinc, um, these are minerals. Organic cofactors are called coenzymes and these are vitamins. And they just help enzymes and substrates to bind together. And so like I said, I typically think of um, a student as a substrate the teacher as an enzyme and a tutor as that um, cofactor that helps what the teacher and the student come together so the information is passed on very effectively. Um, that's it for this chapter. So I'm going to um, well pause this and upload it to YouTube. And I will see you tomorrow evening. So enjoy your class or enjoy the rest of your um, Sunday. Bye.